So, today we are in Exodus chapter 32, and it is, uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot happens in this particular section of scripture, and so uh, there's, there's a lot to look at, a lot, a lot can be gleaned from this, so let me pray and we'll get started. Father God, uh, I thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for uh, just the ability to be here. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help me speak correctly, Lord, that uh, you would prepare each heart for what you have. And Lord, that we would uh, just be blessed by what you have to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, the uh, where we're at in the whole progression of things, if I can bring you up to speed on what's happening. Uh, if you remember, Moses is on the mountain, and he's gotten what we've talked about uh, in the past few Sundays, and what's happening there is he's gotten all the instructions for the making of the tabernacle. And so if you remember also that Moses has not just been on the mountain once, he's been up and down. So we are looking at a period of time which he's in his sixth assignment sent up the mountain. And so if you remember what, what has happened before is the children of Israel uh, in chapter 19, God says, I want you to be my people. I want you to be a royal priesthood. They say, yes, we want that. So the Lord comes up uh, or Moses goes up and he talks to the Lord and he gets the Ten Commandments. He doesn't have them on the tablets yet, but in both instances in chapter 19 and chapter 20, he says, yes, we want this. We will do everything that you say. And then when he goes back up, uh, this the sixth ascent. He's in a, uh, what we see is Acts chapter twenty four verse one. Uh, Moses is summoned again to the top of Mount Sinai, and at this time he's supposed to bring Aaron and his sons, Nahab and Abihu, and the seventy elders. And the next morning, Moses built an offer at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve pillars representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he burnt burned offerings for the fellowship offer, offerings and read the book of the covenant to the people, who responded, "We will do everything that the Lord has." Said. Said, and we will obey, this is in verse 7, chapter 19, to ratify the covenant, Moses sprinkled the people with the blood of the sacrifice. And after that ceremony, Moses, Aaron, and uh, Nahab and Abihu and the elders ascended the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel under the feet, uh, like something like pavement, which is lapis lazuli, bright blue sky, and this is still in Exodus 24, and God allows these men to live, even though they've got a glimpse of heaven, and so then God continues, com commands Moses to come up to the top of the si Mount Sinai in order to receive the stone tablets. So, so the rest of the elders are further down, and then Moses goes up with Joshua, takes Joshua Joshua with him. So this kind of is where Moses, so the last chapter 24 and on, this is where Moses has been up on the mountain. So all the instructions we've heard for the last chapters uh, have been uh, basically Moses on the mountain and the kids are left unattended down there. But it would appear that at some point that Aaron went uh, down the mountain and he's there with the children of Israel. And so this is, this is the beginning of uh, what happens here in chapter 32. And, and so we're going to look at this, this section first. So this is 32 starting in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Make for us gods for whom will go before us, because this Moses, the man you brought up from the mountain, from the land brought us up from the land of Egypt. We don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron replied to them, take off your gold rings that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them and fashioned with an engraving tool and made it into the image of a calf. And they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it and made made an announcement that there will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. Early the next morning they rose and offered burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings and the people sat down and drank and then they got up to party. I got some questions. <laughs> That's the first thing when I was looking at this. I was like, I have some questions. What, hap what happened to this guy? What, what, happened, what happened to these people? What happened to Aaron? What, what, how, how did... 
how did this all get going? So, so you got to call in to call in what's happening with the people, what's happening with Aaron's leadership, what is their understanding of what happened uh, w- with God after everything he's shown them, and how did how did they get to this place, right? And so, some stuff in the language that that now, and I'm not not making excuses. But I'm going to go through some reasons, and the reason for going through the reasons is that we probably ought to take a look at what the reasons they had for for how they acted so we can avoid those reasons. So just thinking about the people, why would they gather around Aaron and say, we don't know what happened to Moses, right? So for 400 years, they're in Egypt, and they're used to the idolatry of the Egyptians, right? They had, uh, you know, you see, and you see this all through through the Old Testament, even when Rebecca went, went with Isaac, she took her household idols. So idolatry is not new, but they're used to this idolatry where they had images that they could control. They had images that they could see. So when, <clears throat> even though that the children of Israel have seen all 10 plagues. They live through that. They've seen him rescue them. Uh, first, he provided water for them. Then he gave them manna in the wilderness. And then he rescued them from the Dead Sea. And now he's brought them out here and they're doing all this worship. And they can still see the cloud with the fire and stuff on Mount Sinai, right? But they're looking for a replacement. And sometimes in their thinking, I think, is, well, we haven't seen Moses in a while. We need another leader. And so we want to make one that is in an image that we can understand. And part of that is their, their, their thinking with all that idolatry is that we can make a God for which we can control. Idolatry is about control, right? And, and just think about this. They're breaking all the commands because they've seen on paper the Ten Commandments, right? I'm the Lord your God. It starts in chapter 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's how he starts the Ten Commandments. And he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make, a, make an idol or a graven image or anything in the shape of heavens. And you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. So when they come and they want a replacement for Moses, they're rejecting the Lord who brought them out of Egypt because they want to make a God that's for them. They uh, are making another God. They think they're having a replacement God, but anytime you have a replacement God, you're having another God beside them. They're making a graven image, right? And then when they pray to it, they're taking the Lord's name in vain. They are three for three on crashing the Ten Commandments that they just decided that they were gonna that they were gonna have. And look at how quickly this escalates. I don't know how long it is from the time where they come to Aaron and say we want to worship another God to the time that he's graving this thing and they're having they're having a party down there. But Moses is up on, only on the hill for uh, on the mountain for forty days, right? So somewhere in there they had to do it. I don't know how many takes it does to do that. So let's just say that Moses is gone for a full month, thirty days, and then at thir- day thirty one they come to Moses. Man, thirty days it took for them to get to full idolatry or back to their reset. They really didn't sit down and think about what has the Lord done for me? What has the Lord required? They went to their idolatrous reset, right? There's a difference between having it happen in your mind and maybe an experience to really being in God's word and the people around them, right? So the people (coughs) are off base in this idolatry. And so they come to a leader and... (laughs) And they gathered around Aaron, and some of the versions say that they implored of him, come make for us gods who will go before us, because this man that you brought from, e- from the land of Egypt, we don't know what to happen to him. And so Aaron's immediate reply is to, to bring me stuff to make an idol. Now, you can look at this leadership, too, of Aaron, all right? He's been here for the whole thing. He was there even back, way back when, after Moses uh, at the burning bush, and he saw the miracle with the staff, and he was talking to that. This is a guy that should know better. He's in leadership, and if you think about, if you think about leadership then or leadership now, all, these, all the people approached him with the thing they wanted. Did he not understand did he have no spine? Was he afraid to oppose the people? 
right? And so, because Aaron's reaction should have been right then, should have been, you guys need to repent. One through three, you're breaking just in asking me the question. Go away and inquire of the Lord that you may not fall into this sin, and I'll pray for you. That should have been his response, right? But obviously, there's a flaw in his faith or his leadership, and he just says, hey, go do what you want. And there's a reality that in, in the church, this is a thing that happens. I have seen churches leave the scripture for what's going on in society. The most recent thing I heard of is that the Church of England just, just said that they are going to bless same-sex marriages. We're not going to have them, but we're going to bless them. Well, they've left, the, they've left the biblical script. And you can see a lot of the liberal churches, they have left the script because people are like, well, we need to be relevant for the culture. We don't need to be relevant. We need to be godly. We need to be holy. So instead of standing up like a leader should, or even if he doesn't have a spine, say, let's just wait and see what happened to Moses. You know, there's a cloud right there. Maybe I'll go up the hill and check. Right? He didn't do any of that. He just buckles right away and says, okay, bring me the stuff. And so the people contribute. And then they said, Israel, these are the gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Man, just just reading everything that we went through and how, how each one of the plagues confronted a god of the Egyptians, everything that we said that we talked about, how can they actually look at this thing and say, this is the god you brought up? Well, this is... This is the same thing. All this goes back, right back to Genesis Genesis 3, right? They're in the garden, Adam and Eve, and the snake says, did God really say? Did God really say? And then he goes on to say, no, no, if you eat it, you'll be like God, knowing good from evil, right? So, so when the people start thinking, well, we don't see Moses, we don't have any, anybody to look to, we don't have that physical thing to look at, let's make an idol, and what, the, what, what has happened there is, did God really bring us out of, did God really bring us out? Is God really that powerful or can I have my own God that I can control? Right? They're in this line of thinking and Aaron goes right with it. So they, they attach, and this is taking the Lord's name in vain, they attach the Lord's name. Because a word in there is Elohim. It's small. If, if you're looking in your Bible, it's, cap, it's not capitalized, so it's small God. But, but they're still retur- referring to this as a deity. So they have, they, they've broken. They're steady breaking all three commandments. And when you do that, you're going to ramble through and break all the rest of the commandments. So this is a terrible and shocking thing that they do, that they assign to a thing that they just made. They saw a guy make it with his engraving tool. And they say, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. Wow. Maybe Aaron's popular, though. (laughs) So so when he said that, I I think that it's just, again, it's bad leadership. So when he saw this, right, again, he's not steering them in the right direction. He's seeing their reaction. Oh, I'm popular. This is cool. I'm part of a movement. He built an altar in front of it and made it uh, uh, an announcement. There'll be a festival tomorrow. Early in the morning, and they rose and made burnt offerings and presented a fellowship offerings, and people sat down and drank and got up to party. So they even offer offerings to this. So Moses is on the hill, and he's getting how this offering is supposed to go, the steps where you're supposed to wash and cleanse yourself and offer an offering and then enter into his holiness, right? That's the setup of the tabernacle, and... Right away, they just make offerings to a God. So this offering thing that God is instituting is probably not a thing that's culturally uh, uh, new, but he's putting in a way that's godly, right? Or God had established it somewhere in the past, just doesn't tell us, and they're offering offerings to God. And then they, uh, they eat, they eat the offering, and then they get up to party. And so everything I read tells me that this is quite a party, all the things at a party. And there's some in that, that, that it was uh, basically a, a big party, a giant orgy. A lot of the, so the, the calf represents, um, uh, represents a god that was probably a Canaanite god. And there was, their practices did have a sexual component. You see this all through the New Testament where Paul is in Corinthians. This is not a new thing either, right? And so this is, this is not just, just a little party where people, it's not a cocktail party, right? Where people are just having conversations and, and hanging out and having, having some, uh, 
what is that charcuterie and cocktails and just having a nice <laughs> nice evening this is a this is a full on this is it's debased so this is in full swing full stop and so then it switches and and now you're on now remember Moses is up there uh 40 days and he uh he's talking to God he's getting uh what we ended up with at the end of 31 that that he has uh uh he's provided craftsmen he's observing talking about the sabbath then he has given the two stone tablets and then the scene switches to what we just covered and now back on the mountain and so the lord says in verse 7 the lord spoke to moses go down at once for the people that you brought up from the land of egypt have acted corruptly and have quickly turned from uh, the way I commanded them, and they have made themselves an image of a calf, and they have bowed down to it to sacrifice to it, and said, Israel, uh, uh, and it, Israel, these are your gods who you brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them, and I may destroy them, and I will take you i will make you into great nation but moses sought favor of the lord his god lord why does your anger burn against your people you brought them out of the land of egypt with great power and stand, uh, a strong hand why should the egyptians say he brought them out with the evil intent to kill them in the mountains and eliminate them from the face of the earth turn your fierce anger uh, and resentment concerning the disaster you planned on your people remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, you swore to them by yourself and declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them your offering in this land that I have promised, and they will inherit it forever. So the Lord relented concerning the disaster he would bring on his people. So in that scene, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> the Lord tells Moses what's going on. They've made it there. They, they, they've, made, they've made the altar, and uh, isn't it interesting that Moses is the leader, and he's talking to God, and he says, the, uh, the people that you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. This is kind of standard, right? When the kids are acting great, they belong to my wife. <laughs> when they're acting foolishly, Somehow, they're just my kids then. I don't know what that's all about, right? But uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, but Moses is a leader, right? He, he's taken, taken into that. So uh, they're a stiff-necked people, and I'll leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, and I will destroy them and make you a great nation. So remember, you hear this, this term stiff-necked people, uh, not only this is not the only time you hear it in the Bible. Uh, most recently, going through Acts, Stephen gives this this defense of the faith, and he calls them stiff-necked people. And this is the thing that gets them stoned. They've been called this before, right? And if you think about stiff-necked people, they just won't. Hunt. Just think about reining a horse. I don't know if you got how many people in here ride, but just think about this. The the thing I get is I was a teenager, and we were riding with some friends that had a horse, and they had this paint horse, and this was a stub. This was a, this was a horse uh, in a mule's body or a mule in a horse horse's body however that works and that horse just would not pay attention so i'm single reining this horse and i have it wrapped around my hand and i'm pulling this horse's head and his his neck he's kept his neck straight but his head is down and he's still going the direction that he wants he will not turn right right and like you're not supposed to single rein a horse you're not supposed to do all that but he was to set and what am, what am I going to do? It's a twelve hundred pound animal, <laughs> and so it just they're just set on what they're going to do. So when he says stiff necked, it just means that you're going they're going to go their own way. They're going to make their own decision at any cost. You know, uh, consequences aside, they they don't care, right? So so when God says this, they won't be taught, they won't be led, that none of that sort of stuff. So this is a pretty serious allegation that the Lord puts against him, right? And that's probably why Stephen, among other things that he said, I mean, he's he was proclaiming the gospel, and they didn't like that because they like their law. But that's what really set him off. 
And God says, uh, now leave me alone so my anger can burn and destroy them and I will make you a great nation. The Lord is well within his right to do this. He could have just rained down fire on those people and crushed them and started over with Moses, right? But it's interesting what happens there that he starts then, but Moses sought favor in the Lord. So here we have this beautiful picture of intercessory prayer. God is, and intercessory prayer is, this, you're just praying on somebody's behalf. And I want to preface this with the, the, Moses says, why does your anger burn against your people? And he goes through, why would you destroy them after you've brought them out with your strong hand? And why would you be a laughingstock after the Egyptians would say, well, he did all this to us just to go out there and smoke his own people, right? Because there would be shame. There would be shame in that for God to do that. Uh, according to the human shame anyway, and you swore to your dece- my descendants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I want to make it clear that God is not duplicitous. God is not um, like, I'm, I'm mad and Moses really convinced him. There's an interplay here that I think is extremely important for us. God is well within his right to say this is the consequence that these people could suffer. We made a covenant, they broke it. And it, just like any contract, if, 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 you know, and we see this in America, any contract, if one person in the uh, contract breaks a contract, then the contract is broken, right? God's well within his right. But remember, God made Moses, God made prayer, God made it so he would allow us the opportunity to intercede for other people. So when God is doing this, he's giving Moses an opportunity to show who he is a leader, who he is as a leader, and intercede for his people. Because when Moses does this, his make this he makes this argument, God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring on the people. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to live to he didn't have to listen to Moses, but he wanted to make sure that if he made these people, remember he made us for relationship with him back in the garden. That relationship got broken when Adam and Eve sinned. It's still broken, but God is restoring that in every move towards Jesus and because we are made in his image, he's he's our Um, we are his people and Moses is his leader, he allows him to intercede because God is good. Moses is a type of Jesus. Moses is no savior. He's a leader. But we see in this picture that a man, if approaching God the right way, can speak to God and intercede for another human being. That's why we pray for each other. That's why it's so important when we have things going on in our lives that we have this fellowship, that we pray for one another and we intercede for healing and we intercede for strength and we intercede for, for holiness and all that sort of stuff. Because through this picture, we know that God has the right, because we're sinners, to just say, nope, you're fired, right? Right? Literally, like we talked a little bit about uh, Nahab and Abihu at the tent of uh, at the tent of uh, uh, at the tent of meeting, where, where they get destroyed by fire for offering strange fire. Look, God doesn't have to listen to us, but He wants to, and in His will, He operates in a way when we intercede through his grace. So you see you see God's righteousness and his justice, you see intercession and you see God's grace, right? And 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 it's kind of hard to think about that in human terms because it does seem like God's duplicitous, but he allows this so we know that God will hear our prayers and he will answer. So how cool is that? So in the interplay then what happens now is after he said this, the Lord relented. How good is that for, uh, for the children of Israel? And I would imagine, I, I don't know who's interceded for me, but there's probably situations in my life, especially when I was a younger man, that, uh, man, I think a lot of prayers probably saved me from a lot of disaster in my life. How beautiful is that? But now what we see 
is that the Lord did relent, and going on in verse 15, then Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tables of the testimony in his hands, and they were inscribed on both sides, front and back, and the tablets were a work of God, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. And Joshua heard the sound of the people, and they shouted, and he said, Moses, this is a sound of war in the camp. But Moses replied, this is not the sound of victory. This is not the cry of defeat. What I hear is the sound of singing. And as they approached the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses became enraged and threw the tablets out of his hand, uh, smashing them at the base of the mountain. And then he took the calf and made, uh, uh, they had made, burnt it up, ground it into powder, sp- uh, scattered it in the water, and put it over the surface of the water and forced the Israelites to drink the water. Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do that you have led them into such great sin? Don't be enraged, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know that the people are intent on evil. They said to me, make gods for us who will go before us uh, because this Moses, this man you brought out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, bring it off and give it to me. And I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Wow. So, (laughs) so, uh, Moses saw that the people were out of control, and Aaron had let them get out of control, and making them a laughing stock of their enemies. And Moses stood at the camp's entrance and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come with me. And all the Levites gathered around him. So, kind of a lot happens there. So now, Moses comes down the mountain, and now he sees the thing, right? He's just interceded, and it's a concept, right? And it's a beautiful thing that he's did. He's not wrong for that. But when he comes down and sees it with his eyes, oh my goodness, he's mad. So he takes the, he takes the tablets, which God has made, this contract, and it's broken on that side, and it symbolizes that it, it, these things are broken. You've broken all of them. All this... All the commandments and all the things that God has given us so you have the ability to meet with God. You've broken it all, kids. And then uh, and then he asked Aaron, well, first, uh, that must have been a thing. Because I think whatever happened when he came down the mountain, I don't know if God helped give him an introduction or everybody knows and the word gets out. So I would imagine that everybody saw this. Moses is standing in front of them. And... He smashes the tablets, and then I don't know how long it takes to burn something like that. Uh, the The thinking is that they made a wooden uh, a wooden uh, frame and then put the gold over it, so it was overlaid when they when they did the work. So it would have burned. But whatever he did, he burned it. So they're watching. How long does it take to smash something, smash something up, break it up, burn it, and then smash it into power powder and then eat it? So this was not just like a one minute thing. Can you imagine the whole assembly sitting there going, man, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know what's going on, right? But it gives everybody the opportunity, I would think, this timeline gives everybody the opportunity to think it through. Uh Uh-oh. God's up there. Dad's back. This thing is heavy duty. I don't know what's going to happen next. But I think, in my mind, there's a timeline in here where these people have time to think about it and repent. And it seems weird why would why would Moses break it all up, s- smash it, break it all up, burn it, put it in water, and make it dr- make him drink it? Look, uh, when Jesus Jesus has us, he talks about the Pharisees, and they're talking about what goes into a person. He says it's not what goes into a person; it's, it's you know uh, your words and stuff. Because you eat something, it goes in you, and and it's eliminated. Right? That's that's the physiological process. So when Moses does that, he's saying, "Hey, the God that you made." I was able to, as a man, grind it up, put it in powder, and you ate it, and it's going to be eliminated. Basically, your God is going to end up as a turd, right? <laughs> I mean, there, there's no other way. There. And so what a, what a visceral picture of what, okay, that, that's what your God's worth. That's the whole thing right there, right? So that, what a picture of that, because it goes into your body. What's going to happen? And so they waited for a long time, and now they see this. Uh-oh. The God that we had in our minds and that we made has no power. So that's, I think it's a pretty powerful picture. And then, 
And then he asked, and then he asked Aaron, what, what did these people do to you that you led them into such sin? And Aaron starts giving the account, and it's mostly true until it's all wrong when he says, and then the calf just came out. They gave me all this stuff, and then it just came out. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, that's something else. And <laughs> it's just like, uh, it's, it, it's, it's all back to Genesis 3 again, right? Because Moses is asking what, what's happening. And, and basically in the garden, uh, Adam, Adam and his leadership goes, well, God, this woman that you gave me, she, she made me do it, right? Aaron's like, uh, well, the thing just kind of happened. It must be their fault, right? He's shirking responsibility. And, and it's, it's really, as a leader, what a gracious thing that God just doesn't smite him right away, right? This guy should be happy to be alive. But that's what he says. And so Moses saw that the people were out of control and that Aaron had let them get out of control and they were a laughing stock of their enemies. This is true to this day. Every time you hear of an evangelical pastor falling, man, doesn't the world love that? Doesn't any moral failing, any mismanagement of the money? This is why we have the qualifications of elders and deacons, because first of all, the, the, the first thing in that is that we want to be holy. We want to be good leaders. We want to be good people for God, right? But as a secondary thing, when you fall, people who are not against Christianity, they, they say, you know, look at that. They're, they're, they're no better than the world. Why would I join a church when, when everybody's just like that, right? It, it's a shameful thing. And so we can't go around worrying what the world thinks. If we're following God and doing what is required by God, we never have to worry about what the world thinks. But there's an element of the way we live. Our holiness should first be to God but then understanding the world around us, that there's, there's reason and protection in that from, from the wiles of the world looking at us like we're a bunch of fools. And so uh, when Moses says that, he's not wrong. He's 100% right. And so, so then he makes this call right? They've had time. I don't know what the timeline past is, but remember, it's important that they took time to do that. So when Moses here uh, in verse 26 says, who is, who is ever for the Lord come with me? And the Levites gather around them. And he told them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Every man fasten on his sword, uh, uh, sword, uh, on his side and go back and forth through the camp uh, from entrance to entrance and each of you kill his brother his friend his neighbor and the Levites did uh, uh, did as the Lord commanded commanded and about 3,000 men fell on that day among the people and afterwards Moses said today you have dedicated to the Lord since men went against his uh, his son his brother and therefore you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. Now, this is pretty tough because this is kind of savagery, right? What kind of savagery is this? What kind of savage God is God, right? When I read through this, you know, preparing, I'd read through it before, but that was when at the beginning, I got questions. Why would God be like this? But he set it up. There's been a clear distinction. He's given time. Well, Moses was breaking down this calf. Well, Moses was burning. Well, Moses was putting it in the water. And then when Moses says, who's with us? He's given time for everybody to choose whether they want the Lord or whether they want to reject the Lord. And it would be clear, and you see this time and other places going forward in, in, in the Old Testament where God has people killed in, in Israel and people outside of Israel because they have fully rejected God. They're going to go to a Christless eternity because they've chosen that. God is just hastening the timeline. And, and he's doing that partly out of protection for the other people. Just think about this. In, in the book of Timothy, he says, hey, this, this bad doctrine can spread like gangrene. Just imagine if you get a cut on your foot and it gets infected and then you have gangrene running up your leg. Your foot is gangrenous, the lines are running up your leg, and you can make a choice. You can, you can lose your leg or you can die because the gangrene is going to spread through your entire body. And so most of us would be like, well, I don't want to be one-legged, 
but I'm going to cut my leg off so I can live, right? Because it's a horrible, painful, disgusting death when the gangrene runs through your body, right? It's not a pretty thing. That's what sin is. That's what sin does, right? Uh, and he's even talking about it in the festival that, that take all the yeast that, that, that represents sin out of the bread because a little leaven lo- uh, uh, leavens the whole lump. And so when you think about it in that term, what's happened here is these 3,000 people have made a clear choice that they have rejected the Lord. And if they're, if they're allowed to remain, you know what's going to happen? Just like it did before the golden calf, it's going to get gangrenous and the sin and the idolatry is going to spread throughout the camp and the children of Israel are going to be destroyed by their own sin. So God puts a stop to it. They had the ability to choose, right? The problem is not in God um, executing his executing these people. The problem is that they rejected God. As hard as that is to swallow, that's the whole deal. Because even in Philippians, it tells us, hey, look, at the name of Christ, every knee will bow. Whether you believe in Jesus, whether you don't. And you can do it, you can do it by compulsion or you can do it by grace. It's going to happen one way or the other. So as hard of a pill as that is to swallow, these people have rejected and he's protected the other people from the idolatry that they will bring in. We've seen it firsthand right here what happens with that. And so then, and that had to be hard for those guys, right? Because they, they went from being idolatrous to, hey, we got we to make a stand. But if you're going to make a stand, once you make the decision, you got to make a stand. you got to make it right away. And then, so... Uh, He says to them afterwards, today you have been dedicated to the Lord for each man went against his son, his brother. Therefore, you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. And then the following day, Moses said to the people, you have committed grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a grave sin, and they have made a gold for themselves. And now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, uh, erase me from the book which you have written. And so uh, the Lord replies to him, The Lord replied to Moses, whoever sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now go and lead the people to the place that I told you and see my angel will go before you. But on the day that I settle my accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for they, uh, for what they did uh, with the calf and Aaron, that Aaron had made. So again, we see Moses then goes back up. I'm going to go back up. So that would be his seventh ascent to the mountain to talk to God, that maybe perhaps I would be able to atone for your sin. Here is Moses after all this, still trying to intercede for his people. He's going to do it. And he, he acknowledges, he, he makes this commission or a confession that the people have sinned i have seen these people sin and this is a public confession for them right you see this in isaiah isaiah 6 says i'm i'm a man of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips and so he's confessed before the lord that he he is a leader that that knows that and now uh if you'd only forgive their sins but if not erase me from your book that i have uh, that you have written so and in, uh, in the original text and in some of the Bibles, you'll see that uh, if you would only forgive their sin. So it would say that in between uh, only forgive their sin, but then it says, but if not, erase me from your book of life. It would appear that he said, forgive your sin, and there's a hyphen there in some of the uh, translations. And in the, in the Hebrew, there's some sort of, I try to explain it to you, but I don't understand it well enough. But there's a pause so it would seem from the text that Moses said that, and there's a pause. We don't know how long. How long did Moses silently wait before the Lord? How long did he sit there and wait for a ro- the, the Lord's reply, if you would only forgive their sin? If you would only forgive their sin and then wait. We don't know. But it's interesting that that's, that's in the text. But, he, but then, after whatever pause it was, but if not, please erase them uh, please erase me from the book that you have written. And so look at how you see Paul do a similar thing when he talks about his brothers. He says, Lord, if you would just give them salvation, I, I, I will give up mine. 
And uh, those two guys have a bigger faith than I do because as much as I want to see people come to the Lord, as much as I want to evangelize and as much as I want to see everybody who I know come to the saving knowledge of grace so they can be in heaven, I don't know that I'm in a place in my faith that I would give that up for, for, for another person, right? Because I, 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 I feel like, I feel like hell's a bad place and I, I have a great relationship with God and I don't want to give that up for another person. And so... Good on him for his love for his people. This is why he's such a good intercessor, I think. But in the Lord's answer, the Lord says, Who's ever sinned against me, I will erase from my book. So what he's saying there, he, he gives it back to the individual. Whoever has not believed in me and made that confession. In the Old Testament, it was your belief that Jesus was coming. For us, it's we believe that Jesus has come and we're looking for heaven. Whoever has made that sin, who's ever sinned against me and not received my forgiveness, well, they're not going to be in the Lamb's book of life. That's pretty clear. So even though Moses is interceding on that, it's a step too far and the Lord puts it back, again, like I said, on the individual. Everybody who's not made that confession... They're not in the book. They're not coming to heaven. So although Moses is great at that and he's, he's a good leader, he, he can't make that, and God makes it clear. You have to be an individual who has my forgiveness. And the nice thing about that, we talk about this all the time, forgiveness is easy, right? Romans 10.9, if you realize that you're a sinner and need forgiveness, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be written in his book, not left out. That's, how, that's just how it is. Now, he's given Moses his answer and he says, go lead my people to the place that I've told you about. Uh, and see, I will send my angel before you, but on that day, I, when I settle my accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And he, uh, the Lord, uh, inflicted a plague on the people for what they did uh, with the calf that Aaron had made. So, it just tells us at the end, God's going to settle his accounts. And we can hope and pray that a lot of those people did see and receive the forgiveness of the Lord, right? But, uh, you know, that's up for the individual to choose. But here's, here's, a, here's the distinction that, that we have to see here, because sometimes we do things in life and we receive God's forgiveness, right? I don't know if you guys have ever had this, where you've had a situation where you receive God's forgiveness, but there's still a natural consequence. The natural consequence is you guys all need a reminder. Everybody who rejected me is now gone, but you guys need to know that there's a natural consequence. Whatever the plague was, they, they, and I'm sure that they knew that it was for that particular purpose. So we can think about that anything in our lives, right? I'm not paying attention one day and I get a speeding ticket. Oops, I feel bad about that. I didn't mean to speed. And even though I've gotten forgiveness... I still got to go to the courthouse and pay the ticket, right? There's natural consequences for everything, good and bad. And so that's just what happened here that, hey, there, here's your natural consequence. At the end of the day, here's what happened. So, but God doesn't leave his people. The awesome thing about that is God doesn't leave his people and Moses doesn't punch out. So next time when we start in Exodus 33, we're going to see, we're going to see how God continues to lead his people because he's also given them a promise that he's going to send his angel before them and he's still going to take them into the land. He still loves them. He still cares for them despite what he had to do with the people who rejected him and the natural consequences. God is loving his people. God is leading his people because he loves us and he wants to have a relationship for us and he's got great plans for him, uh, for Moses and for all the people. Just like he does for us, he has great plans. So if you find yourself in a spot where, man, my life is kind of a disaster or you find yourself with another believer, my life is in a disaster, you can assure them, hey, look, there might be a tough moment here, right? But God is still going to lead you to the land that he has. He still has purpose for you here on earth, and he has great purpose for you taking you to heaven. So here and in heaven, God is still with you. That's the picture we get. So there's a lot here in chapter 32, but a lot of takeaways for us these days. But I think the biggest takeaway is that um, God is holy. We sin. God addresses that sin, but he still forgives us. He still leads us, and he still has purpose for us. Amen? Father God, uh, thank you for...
everything you teach us through your word. And Lord, uh, uh, sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow and it's a head scratcher, uh, especially when I get started and asking the questions, Lord. But I just, I, I just love it that, uh, that you have purpose for everything, that you make it clear. Lord, I pray that each one of us would uh, just look at our lives and, uh, and ask you, Lord, are, are there idols in my life that I need to take out, Lord? Uh, uh, and, and we know that you're faithful to do that. And Lord, uh, when, when we do it by will, uh, it, it's just easier than when we have to do it by compulsion. But I pray that each one of us would do that, that you would, uh, because of that, draw us closer to you in relationship and to one another. And Lord, that uh, we would just know that being close to you and holy is, is just good and right. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.